Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is Torsten Hoffler from ETH Zurich. Torsten, hey, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Rich. Well, Torsten, you know, uh, I saw an opportunity. You had some trouble with travel and you missed a key- your own keynote in Brazil. I thought we'd, we'd uh, cover it here. So with that, uh, let's learn more about data-centric parallel programming. Yeah, thanks, Rich, for that opportunity. It was a, a quite funny travel, but I cannot recommend Lufthansa as an airline, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so let's get to, to, to the point of this keynote. Uh, data-centric parallel programming is actually a, 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 yeah, well, a project that has been going on since quite a while in my lab. Um, it is uh, funded by the European Union as an ERC project, and it's, it's quite old, but it's a huge team effort. And I first want to acknowledge all the team members that you can see on the slide, like Alex, uh, Tal, Guillermo, Timo, Mathieu, and Johannes, and the whole team that has been involved in, in developing this quite complex piece of software and set of ideas, actually. It's, it's really a large set of ideas in, in my lab. Uh, furthermore, I want to uh, make you aware of the Euro MPI conference that will be held in September in wonderful Zurich, uh, where we are right at uh, right now. And Rich actually likes the weather, apparently. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Excellent. So let's get started with this, uh, with the motivation of the talk. So first of all, the interesting insight that we or- already had multiple times is that the hardware is changing over the last couple of decades. And many of you have seen this diagram. And in this diagram, it really shows the development of hardware from 1970s to um, the days today. And we all know that about uh, 2006, um, the NART scaling stopped, and this is why the multi-core crisis was started. And um, we got more and more uh, cores that we have to deal with, and the resurgence of the parallel programming field was actually starting hard. But what um, some of some of industry is still arguing is that Moore's law is actually uh, dead, in my opinion. And uh, some people agree, but somehow this economic argument is not quite uh, moving forward anymore as it used to be. So we are still in the exponential scaling area. However, Moore's law strictly seen, which has the constant to the, uh, which had a constant to the exponent that every 18 months, the number of transistors do- doubles at equal cost is strictly seen not true anymore. And so now we need to understand how to use these transistors more efficiently. But let me give us a little bit of a background how scaling happened in the in the past. So we started I mean, way earlier, but there was an, an, a time where we were running from 130 nanometers to 90 to 65 to 45. This is actually when I got involved somehow um, as, a, as a young student uh, working for AMD, trying to help them to develop high K the electric car to make this, this happen. The interesting fact is also that at that time, or from that time, we have the most uh, precise publicly available data on the um, energy consumption of chips for performing a floating point addition multiplication and also data movement to different sizes of memory. So for example, here you can see the data for 32-bit floating point addition, which is uh, one picojoule multiplication, three picojoules. But what's more interesting is that actually the data movement from an eight kilobyte cache, for example, in a level one cache, is already 10 picojoule. If you move data from larger um, SRAM cells or larger SRAM arrays, for example, from a one megabyte array, that's a factor of 10 more. So the size matters here. If you go to DRAM, then we are multiple orders of magnitude um, over this. But then the scaling continued, of course, and as you know, today we are going down to um, seven nanometers in the latest uh, process. And this trend is clear, but it's also clear that this trend will stop at some point because obviously zero nanometer is is (laughs) one boundary point, um, but the size of an atom is also a boundary point. But what probably many of you don't know is that there is another limit involved in the scaling of uh, computation, and this is called the Landau limit. So the Landau limit is, uh, is basically the amount of energy required to erase or um, or uh, create a single bit, so a single bit of entropy. And this is what I have on the slide here. Now the question is, are we close to that Landau limit already in the energy consumption? Because that Landau limit is a lower bound in terms of physics. So if you want to uh, flip a bit from zero to one or from one to zero, that's the amount of energy you need. So three times 10 to the minus uh, 21 joules. But today we are still um, about a million away from that if you look at the uh, computers that, that we or the chips that we build today. So that's not a big problem. However, the other problem that we have that we're actually facing actively today is the electrical data movement. 
where we can see that the electrical data movement here is equivalent, or the, the electrical, the loss due to electrical data movement is equivalent to the resistance C times the length of the wire, which is fine, but divided by the cross-section area. And the interesting insight is here that as we shrink the transistors, we shrink, of course, the metal layers with them because they have to fit underneath the logic. And that means that we will increase the energy consumption for the same distance we are moving. And this increases linearly, so this is a huge problem. So what this basically means, we have a physical reason for moving towards higher locality. And this is what brings me to the uh, three L's of modern computing in this sense. So locality, locality, locality. But it's of course spatial locality, temporal locality, and control locality. So you know these, um, the first two from school. And the last one is not so obvious because the last one, the control locality, is something that I want to introduce now. Actually, if you are interested in the first two and also partially in the, uh, the last one, We've, there is a very good overview paper by Dieter Munat, uh, who's also at this conference here, um, and, and friends, and I've also been involved, that really overviews the trends in data locality abstractions for HPC systems for the coming years and also the past. But now let me explain what I mean by control locality. So if we go back to von Neumann, um, we have a very simple uh, load store architecture, which has been dominating the computing market basically since uh, its inception. Um, if we want to solve this x equals a plus b, let me explain how you would do this. You would have a memory, you would have an arithmetic logical unit, you would have a set of registers, and you would have a control block that basically interprets the control instructions to execute the actual calculation. Furthermore, you would have a cache, but the cache has no functional um, capacity in this sense, so the cache just improves performance. Then they're all connected by um, a, a control path, which is here shown in red, and also a data path, which is shown by the width of the path. And what happens in a von Neumann architecture is that the control unit loads an instruction from memory that instructs the um, data fetch unit to load the value into a register. Furthermore, of course, since we, since we need two values, we need to load another control instruction from memory that instructs to load the second operand. And then since we want to add them, we need to load another control instructions that the instruction from main memory that tells us to add these two values. And then, of course, we want to store it back. So as you can see, every single operation here requires a load from memory of an instruction, but also typically a load from memory of an operand if it's a memory instruction. So there's a very high overhead in this control just by moving the data for the control itself that the architecture knows what to do, but also the data in general that has to go back and forth between main memory and the, and the register bank. And here, um, actually a very nice uh, energy breakdown by Mark Horowitz shows us that uh, the total energy consumption per instruction in the 45 nanometer process that I showed in the previous slide is 70 picojoule, but the add itself, the actual operation being performed, is nearly negligible. So it's, it's about 5% here, I would guess, from, from this plot. But we'll see it in a, in a couple of minutes. But then there was another different idea, um, basically what many people call non von Neumann architecture, static data flow architectures, which were already kind of hinted at uh, by Bacos in 1977 in his Turing Award acceptance lecture, that we really should not accept the von Neumann bottleneck or the von Neumann architecture as the final wisdom to perform computation. So now the question is, well, we have been living with this for years, but can we make the computation more efficient by looking at a different architecture? And of course, we are not first to look at this. Data flow architectures are old, very old concept, but they have so far not been highly successful in, um, in the industry because they are quite hard to program. Let me now show you how data flow architecture works. Of course, in the memory, you also have the operands and uh, the result vector as you want. And here I have a, a slightly more complex equation because with only one operation, it would be quite simple. And then you build a network where the ALUs are aligned to the actual operation that you want to perform. What's now different or very different from the load store architecture is that the buffers are specifically placed in that network very close to the ALUs. and The connections are specifically designed to only solve that one particular purpose. And if you now solve this equation, as you can see, this is kind of the data flow style. The data flows through these arithmetic logical units again um, that now have a single purpose only. The energy consumption is orders of magnitude less than the uh, load store architecture because there's no such overhead as fetching the data because the data itself is, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, fetching the instructions because the instruction and the uh, what is executed itself is in fact encoded somehow in the structure of the data flow network itself. This is why I would say 
that the control locality of data flow is extremely high, while it's quite low in von Neumann, because you have to fetch these non-local control instructions, while in the um, data flow architecture, it's, there is basically no control instruction, so thus very high locality. So you could now argue that GPUs are solving all these problems with the uh, SIMD model, but the SIMD model is really just an extreme case of the von Neumann architecture, where the control is shared between multiple ALUs. So there is one control unit that now controls here this array of uh, 10 arithmetic logical units. And this is great because now you could argue, well, of course, now the control goes down, my efficiency goes up because I have more computations in the ALU. So where's the problem? The problem is still that the uh, GPU itself requires a quite large reg uh, register set that allows random access. And this register set, for example, here with uh, if we address one megabyte, again, uses 100 picojoule um, energy to load a single operand. So as we saw in the beginning, computing the operand is not the problem. That is the one picojoule anyway, but loading it is the problem. And the GPU does not really address this problem because it has this very large register set. On the other hand, the data flow architecture, as I mentioned, the registers are specific to the actual task at hand. So I don't need a random uh, access register set to perform this calculation. This means that I can essentially just run this um, well, specialized architecture and then get the uh, access at about 0 0.1 picojoule. So, but of course, the GPU has a lower control locality in, in the terms that I just defined than a CPU. So it's already a step in the right direction. But I would say to use the transistors to the greatest extent, to the greatest efficiency, we should specialize or we could specialize it further to data flow architectures. So really at the end, if you think about it, high performance computing became a data management challenge. We need to figure out where the data is, how to move the data through our computation, and really try to understand exactly what we do. If you think about many of the optimizations we do today, they really manage data, register tiling and many others. So let's now actually come to the conclusion that data movement is dominating everything. And this is, again, something that, that I have not invented. There is a, was a large number of workshops in the DOE in the couple, last couple of years. So just to quote some, um, to show some pictures here by, by John Schalf and, and colleagues that have actually um, parameterized and also Peter Kagi parameterized these uh, specifics, uh, specific energy consumptions at the specific memory layers. And there was a very interesting uh, article which is already um, coming to age somehow, which is by Shekhar Borkar and Andrew Chien when uh, both of them were still at Intel, um, at the future, uh, called The Future of Microprocessors, a wonderful article. I can highly recommend it. Um, I just want to quote, uh, I just want to mention one thing. The phrase data movement appears 18 times on these 11 pages. So it is, in fact, quite uh, important there. And what's even better that I want to quote here is that really the uh, future of us, uh, of microprocessing, depends on, and I'm quoting, sophisticated software to place computation and data so as to minimize data movement. So, well, architects make it a software problem. Interesting. Let's see. The sophisticated software. How do we program today with the sophisticated software? Well, to a good approximation, today we program how we programmed yesterday, or maybe last year or maybe four decades ago, because that's exactly what we do. We program like we did four decades ago. Basically the same. So this is what I would call control-centric programming. So control-centric programming is really the idea where you specify your specify your algorithm as a, as a set of steps that you define A plus B and B plus C, but you don't really worry about the data movement. So you worry about the operation counts. And if you look at the high-performance computing community today, flops still play an overarchingly important role. So everybody seems to count flops. If you look at the theory in computer science, everybody counts the number of operations. So it's kind of the metric. However, we just learned that data movement is the problem in performance, isn't it? So nobody worries about data movement. Everybody programs in a control-centric manner. Shouldn't we change that? Yes, of course. So there is one approach that has been uh, taken that uh, route that is the Legion language that's a good direction towards data-centric. So coming out of Stanford from Alex Eichen's group, um, quite an impressive work. But I would say uh, Legion really takes the tasking model towards a more data-centric uh, world. But it's not really exposing all the dependencies. So we can go one step further, because Legion in the sense is still uh, control-centric. And in order to address different devices, you would still need to write specific code for these devices. But what if we just invert the model and take the final step and say, look, we make everything uh, data-centric now. We look at everything as a data flow model and its dependencies inst uh, instead. So 
at least this view should be the view of the performance engineer. And uh, let me introduce this a little bit more. So what we propose in this DAP project is in fact a performance port portable programming environment that we call DACE, um, where we have a strict separation of concerns between the domain scientist, the performance engineer, and then the system itself. The domain scientist, because, uh, of course, does not necessarily want to work on um, only the um, well, only the data flow view, because the domain scientist has an algorithm in mind. The algorithm will be impl implemented in some language, like a domain-specific language, the, like in Python or TensorFlow or MATLAB or something like that. And this is, of course, uh, control-centric, because this is how we, we humans think. But then the performance engineer in our mode, in our model, sees the data dependencies and sees where the data flows. And we represent this in a, what we call a data-centric intermediate representation or stateful data flow graphs. And I will explain this in a couple of minutes. And then the performance engineer, who now sees all the flow of the data and all the movement of the data and doesn't really focus on the instructions or the operations, can map this in an efficient way to the um, system architecture. And then, of course, um, having a, a runtime or a, a tuning loop going back and forth, gathering performance results like we do today, and then tuning uh, the shape of the SDFG further without changing its semantics. So the idea is domain scientist has a simplified view of the problem in his or her own language, and then the performance engineer has a language that is designed for performance engineering. It's not what we do today. Because today what you would do if you're a physicist, or uh, I don't want to pick on physicists here, but also uh, other scientists or meteorologists, you write your code in something like Fortran or Python that's convenient to you. And then if you run it at a very large scale system, let's say a uh, uh, like top class supercomputer, you work typically with performance engineers or somebody who has a computer science background to tune that code for you. And if you're unlucky, they will rewrite your code, send it back to you, and you will not recognize the code uh, from what it was before. And typically, you will not be able to change your code easily to whatever change you want to apply to it or apply and uh, implement a new method or something like this. So, and this is somewhat the idea of, of our, uh, to enable uh, transparent optimization is the idea of the STEP project. So we have uh, certain concepts in this project which are somewhat similar to the um, um, object-oriented concepts. So for example, we define data containers. And as you will see, this is a largely um, visual representation of the data flow that we uh, that we employ because that is a very natural way of looking at uh, how things flow of course as kind of some kind of graph and, and the graph you want to have a visual representation for as a human at least so we have these containers where we have data transient data and streams we have computation of course still you require computation even in data centric models uh, that we call tasklets and then we also have nested computations which are similar to functions in these uh, in these graphs and um, then we, of course, also have data flow between these objects. So data can flow between containers and computation or between computation and containers. And these are just arrows and um, they're implemented at the end then by either just accessing an arrow, uh, a piece of data, copying it or streaming it. Or I don't want to get too much into the implementation details. And then, of course, since we require a parallel and heterogeneous uh, language or sorry, a language that supports parallel and heterogeneous systems, we also express parallelism. So we express parallelism in two different ways. One way is to express it as states, and this is not really parallelism. You could call this kind of anti-parallelism. So if I have two states, it means these states are executed uh, sequentially if they are connected by an arrow, I mean, if, if there is some flow between these states. And this is somewhat of an iteration. You can imagine this as an iteration because you need to finish iteration i before you start iteration i plus 1. These two iterations would be in two different states in the model. And if you now want to express parallelism and not limit it, then you would use a construct that we call a map, which is very similar to the map in, in, that we know from MapReduce. So it's essentially just an independent uh, loop body that would then ex execute a tasklet. But we'll get to some more details. So let me show you a first example in, in our language, which is um, currently embedded in Python. Um, and this is, as I mentioned, a DACE language. And it's uh, quite cool because we can call this DACE program. And DACE stands for data centric. So it's really the data centric program. So here's the Laplace uh, function definition. And this is just normal Python code, as you can tell here. And it simply has this annotation that says this is a DACE program. And then you would write your loops like you would use them and uh, like you would, are used to writing them. And uh, you can already see that we have a DACE map in there, which basically indicates to the runtime system that this would be a parallel map. 
And then we have the, the computation tasklet. So this still looks very much like a normal Python program with a bunch of annotations. What is now different or special about our view is that we now specify the data dependencies. In this case, the data dependency specification is uh, somewhat overly complicated and could be derived by a good compiler, but this is just an educational case where you can see that we now um, actually have this array A, right? it's a Laplacian operator after all, where we um, have two different, um, where we represent two different steps of the operation because it's an iterative process, as you can see in this range T up there, and um, we write to the even and the odd ones in, uh, in the different, uh, so we read from the even and write to the odd, or read from the odd and write to the even in the different iterations, and this is all represented by this data dependency specification here. So now our tool chain can derive automatically from this uh, syntax that we chose, so variable name, direction, either reading or writing, and then a data identifier, which is a, a, a container in that case, and then uh, a little bit of uh, the meta for the number of accesses, and then of course a range in this uh, array that we can actually identify fine-grained data accesses relative to the specific offset of the array. And we can also show this graphically, which is now more intuitive to the performance engineer, of course, the trained performance engineer, that we would um, have this one state here. This is the blue box. And then we have the data flow represented in the state. So you can see the map, um, this um, for ranging from i equals 1 to n minus 1, reading from the array A. And then uh, the data is ingested by this Laplace operator in three different um, kinds and then I mean, this is this is the stencil operator basically that reads three different elements and then it uh, emits or it writes one output array element and then the map is over and this is of course written again to a then once the iteration is over we go back to the same state because we repeat the next iteration exactly the same unless t is now bigger or small t is now bigger than the capital t which is the total number of iterations so this is the simplest program you can write. We'll get to some more complicated programs soon. Of course, um, what is a good programming language? Or what is a programming language worth without an interface, especially um, um, uh, a new and very complex programming language like, like we have here? And we have a, um, well, an IDE, essentially, where you can look at the source code, look at transformations, and I will discuss this in a couple of minutes. Look at the resulting graph of the source code, so the data dependency graph. Look at the generated code because at the end our Python code, as you can see here, is going to be gener uh, going to be transpiled into a C++ code because Python is not known uh, as an interpreted language, not known to be running very efficiently on high performance computing systems. Thus, all the code that eventually runs on the system is C++ code that we generate from the Python representation, and we also have an, an uh, built-in performance uh, measurement and analysis uh, framework in this uh, diode user interface that, that we have experimentally right now. So let me show you an example. And on the left side, so this is matrix multiplication on an x86 machine. And on the left side, you can see the stateful data flow graph for this um, matrix multiplication. In fact, you would, um, this is what the performance engineer would see. And now what the performance engineer can do is, of course, evaluate the performance of this particular implementation. So this means we would take the stateful data flow graph, we would generate C++ code, and we would run that C++ code on the, um, on the target architecture. And this is what we do here. This is the naive implementation. We do a first optimization, which we call MapReduce Fusion. And now we can go ahead and we can apply a different optimization. So you see this one where the loop indices in the first map switch. If performance gets higher, now we do tiling, now we do another level of tiling, we introduce local storage. You can see how the stateful data flow graph um, successively gets more and more complex. We can now um, introduce some transient arrays. And at the end, we get about 25% close to Intel's MKL, which is highly tuned to that particular um, particular architecture. And I could now show you um, show this to you in a small demo, but well, let's not do this. Uh, there's a video online that we can link um, later that, shows, that, that demonstrates this. This takes about five minutes. And actually, if you tune more, you can get to 98.6% of the math kernel library um, that Intel provides. And now the question is, of course, do we really care about matrix multiplication on x86 CPUs? No. The answer is, if you're an academic, maybe, uh, but of course there is more to it. And now let me explain uh, the performance portability aspects, because I have not really shown you performance portability, I've just shown you how to generate fast code for x86. And there are now two different aspects to this. 
the two different architectures that I explained to you before. Right? The load store architectures, the question is how do we map to this? And then I will, in the next slide, I will explain how to map to the data flow style architectures or pipeline architectures. So what we do for load store architectures, we have a recursive uh, code generator that emits C++ or CUDA codes for uh, CUDA code for GPUs. And here's just a small excerpt of the generated code. Um, the parallel for imp implementing parallelism, we either use OpenMP, Atomics and Threads on CPUs, or we use um, CUDA kernels and streams like you would do on a standard uh, GPU today. And of course, in the graph itself, all the connected components that are not dependent can run concurrently, so which is actually a quite nice side effect. So you get functional parallelism in addition to the data parallelism you would uh, just simply have if you do a standard OpenMP or something like this. And of course, then we need to understand how to map the memory and how to interact with accelerators. But this is just simply allocating memory and shoving it back and forth to the computation as we need it. But this is, okay, I say it's simply, but this is actually the key of the, of the um, framework itself. And the assumption is always that we never change the tasklet code. So we never change the calculations. We only change the way we move the data back and forth and the mapping of the data. This is the key concept, which makes it different from compilers because compilers would need to understand, uh, traditional compilers would need to understand the data dependencies from the actual operations, which we don't because we have all the data because you already gave it to us as a programmer. And this is why we can uh, transform all these codes in a very aggressive way and change the data movement quite aggressively. For example, we can map the specification you give us to a fully pipelined architecture like an FPGA or a CGRA or something that uses uh, the silicon more efficiently than load store architectures. And as a prototype, what we do today is we um, generate modules in a hardware definition language or in a high level synthesis language. Currently, we use SDXL uh, from, from Xilinx, so using an OpenMP, uh, sorry, an um, OpenCL front end. And, and here we, we implement um, a small FPGA state machine. So basically every nested SDFG, which is an SDFG inside an SDFG, as I mentioned before, it's similar to a function call as a small FPGA state machine. So parallelism, of course, on FPGAs, you naturally exploit pipelines or vectorization in terms of replication. Um, this is just something we do automatically. So a map, you can either vectorize or pipeline. Um, successive maps that are data dependent, you can pipeline in any case. And then, of course, you can now parametrically define systolic arrays, like, for example, the uh, you know, Google TPU implements um, in hardware. So we can do this all from your code. Right? So we can build you a specialized systolic array um, relatively automatically from your well, whatever your problem is, and not just matrix multiplication like the TPU supports today. Um, and, and then, of course, we manage all the data from you uh, for you that comes out of DRAM. It has to move through the chip and eventually has to go back to DRAM. And uh, the memory accesses are in an FPGA specific because, of course, um, we have to vectorize the memory accesses itself, themselves because they come with a pretty wide bus. Uh, we have to generate all the, uh, all the bursts. And internally on chip, we then have to manage all the streams that move between these programming, uh, sorry, uh, processing elements on chip. But this is all done by the framework automatically and uh, somewhat tunable by the performance um, engineer. By the way, when I say automatically, I really mean that we support a human to perform this optimization. So there's no magic in this framework in the sense that this is not drop in your code and it'll generate the best possible representation. No, you drop in your code and it'll show you the data-centric representation, this graph, and you can go ahead and tune that graph as a performance engineer. And then the code is generated automatically for the target device. Of course, it's now obvious that the next step we want to do is to automate that and have some kind of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence take over the performance engineer's job, but this will take a while. So performance engineers are safe for now. Um, so now let's look at some results that we have gathered with that particular framework. Um, so we look at three different platforms, very different platforms. So one is a standard Intel uh, Xeon CPU, another one is a Tesla P100 GPU, and the third one is the wonderful uh, Xilinx uh, VCU 1525 on a, on a Xilinx FPGA. And uh, we use baseline compilers, the GCC, a late version of the GCC compiler, Clang and ICC compilers that we use as, as multiple baselines. We also use uh, polyhedral optimization, uh, uh, polyhedral compilers. These are poly, Pluto, and PPCG. 
in the um, most recent versions. And of course, for GPU and FPGA, we have to use uh, CUDA's NVCC and Xilinx STXL. Um, and here we use the 2018.2 version. And we also compare to get even more baselines to optimizing frameworks like HPX, Halite, and of course, uh, Intel's MKL, NVIDIA's Kublas, Kuspars, Cutlass, and NVIDIA Cup, just to get the baselines and the comparison points of how fast you can get on these architectures. Sometimes we get even faster, which is uh, partially surprising. Um, so we look at fundamental kernels. In this case here, we look at five fundamental kernels, database, matrix multiplication, histogram, Jacobi stencil, and sparse matrix vector multiplication. I don't want to spend more time explaining those because they're somewhat standard kernels in the community. And you can read about this in, in our paper that we will also reference. Interestingly, for the database case, we get eight times faster, or more than eight times faster than any of the uh, comparison points. Um, of course, for the matrix multiplication, we will not beat uh, Intel's MKL, because that is the, the golden standard, but we get up to 98.6% of the performance here, um, much, much, much faster than the baseline compilers and even the polyhedral compilers. Um, for the histogram experiment, we get about a factor of 2.5 faster than the fastest one, which is Halite, that has been tuned for this. Um, for Jacobi, we are slightly slower than Halite um, and much faster than all the standard compilers, of course. Um, and for sparse matrix vector multiplication, we essentially match the performance of the Intel MKL. So that's a quite encouraging result. But of course, we're still at CPU, right? Didn't I promise you uh, performance portability? Well, now we run the exact same code, the exact same input code. Remember, the, uh, the domain scientist's view of the code, but tuned for the different architectures by only changing the stateful data flow graph internal representation. So we don't change the programmer's view of the code, but we change the performance engineer's view of the code. And here, um, we achieve also quite encouraging results on the GPU. For example, for the matrix multiplication, we are 90% close to the NVIDIA um, Cutlass library. Um, and for the FPGA implementation, we are uh, 20 times faster than, the, than another framework that has been published recently. That's the spatial framework coming out of Stanford, I believe. Um, interestingly, for the Jacobi, uh, we beat the HLS uh, baseline with, our, with very simple optimizations by a factor of 300,000 times. <laughs> so, but that's just because it, it's basically not optimized and, and uses only 1% or even less of the FPGA, while our implementation is able to unroll a complete systolic array into this FPGA, performing just the Jacobi um, operations. Okay, but then of course, now the question is, how do we compare to optimizing compilers such as the um, uh, polyhedral compiler toolchain for in their own ballpark? Basically, we choose the Polybench, which is a benchmark environment designed for the NVIDIA, sorry, for polyhedral compilation only. So it has about 30 applications and we do not do any transformation. So we just check our code generator um, over the general purpose compilers, and there we achieve uh, 1.4x or 40% geometric mean speed up over all these uh, 30 applications. And then you can look at them in the paper if you, uh, if you really want to know all the details. But interestingly, for the automatically transformed GPU code, we are still faster than the polyhedral frameworks themselves. So we're still about 12% in the geo mean faster. For some, we are slower, of course, uh, but it's geo mean of uh, 30 applications than the optimizing compilers. For compiler, uh, sorry, for the FPGA case, we have no um, comparison point because we are the first um, framework that is able to place all of the polybench applications, all 30 of them, on the FPGA and uh, place and route them in a runnable form. So now let's do a small case study, uh, parallel breadth first search, so that you a bit more understand how, to, how this works. And we are comparing here to Galois and Gluon, which are the state of the art uh, frameworks for this. We look at some graphs, um, road networks, social networks, and synthetic graphs to just see that it also works for non-structured uh, applications. So it also works for breadth first search, which is a completely un unstructured uh, application. So in here, I could now explain you for uh, 30 minutes this very complex uh, SDFG, but I'm not going to um, because that is just something that, that you can digest at home or you can ask us later about uh, how this uh, exactly works. But BFS is also supported by the framework. And interestingly, we achieve speed up over uh, all the manually tuned graph frameworks um, designed for this specific purpose. So. Now I showed you performance portability, but at the end, you're still, you're still skeptical, I would believe, because so far we've only looked at micro benchmarks. 
And microbenchmarks is, of course, for HPC folks, not too exciting because we care about real application. So in the last part of my talk, I want to remind you of the actual goal of this DAP project to take a domain scientist and enable the domain scientist to write a full application and then a performance engineer to tune a full application to a specific system or to multiple specific systems. So let's now do a case study with a real application. Actually, that application is uh, getting back to the beginning of physics because I mentioned that the problem in transistors today is that they overheat. So if we could actually cool these transistors better then, or if somehow avoid the heating in, the, in those transistors. Um, I told you that we are still a factor of a million away from the Landau limit, so there's some, something to be gained. Then we could scale CPUs better and we could move forward um, even in the silicon design today. So we could actually push the NART scaling a bit further. So this is the research of one of my colleagues at ETH, Mathieu Louisier, um, who is a physicist or working in the um, ETET and uh, the electrical engineering department, and he's trying to understand the material properties of these transistors with uh, up initio simulations. So, and I could now explain you all of these plots. In fact, I could not explain you these plots, but Matthew could explain you these plots. Um, and these are generated by a simulation code that is actually quite well known in the um, high performance computing community because that code called OMEN has been a Gordon Bell Award finalist twice once in 2011 and once in 2015. And one of those two years, and now I'm blanking on the exact year, it was even an honorable mention for the, uh, for the award itself. So it is a quite well-known code, well-tuned, and solves a real science problem. It's also a quite large code. So it has about 90,000 lines of code. It's combining C, C++, CUDA, MPI, OpenMP to achieve that performance uh, that was reported in these uh, Gordon Bell finalist runs. So we are taking code that is not trivial to optimize. So this code actually consists of multiple phases. And, and again, I'm, I'm not the mathematician or, or physicist in this case, but it solves a set of equations in iterative form. It combines so-called, uh, uh, well, it solves the Green's function equation and uh, combines SSE uh, steps moving back and forth between the electrons and the phonons. So, but we need to ask Matthew about the details. But what we can see here is actually the 90,000 lines of code, I can show it on a single slide um, in a, a stateful data flow graph that we of course collapsed. So these tasklets that you can see in the middle here, the RGF and SSE phases, they of course contain more stateful data flow graphs internally or get, uh, represent a more complex graph in total. So, but in general, it's these two phases, GF and SSE. So let's focus on the SSE phase. So if you just look at the SSE phase, which is actually a very large share of the, of the total runtime, um, we can see a specific loop structure. As you can see in this map on the, on the top left, so we have the, the um, K points, and then we have electrons, and so on. And this is the natural loop tiling that is, is natural to the domain scientist. So this is something that, that Matthew wrote, uh, or Matthew and colleagues wrote in this original omen, and they arranged the loops, of course, as the physicist would do in this uh, natural view. And if you change that view, um, they may not like you anymore as a performance engineer. Um, so based on that view, there was a, a they developed an, a, a specific decomposition to run it on a large scale supercomputer. And they used uh, eventually broadcast, reduce, and, and lots of point to point communication and many MPI invocations to actually implement this communication pattern. In the data centric view, what we saw was that, well, you could actually reduce the data movement quite substantially by changing some of these loops. Because when you look at the source code, especially if the source code is distributed across dozens of files, where, I mean, these loops are distributed across dozens of files, you don't necessarily see how the data flows. But that's exactly the point of the stateful data flow graphs. So we are now able to look at the overall data flow and optimize the data flow by changing the loop order and thus also change the domain decomposition, as you can see down here. So the domain decomposition itself looks slightly more complicated. However, we can reduce um, the, the used MPI functions from broadcast reduce point to point, a very complex uh, communication pattern, to a single collective all to all. And actually, we only have four MPI invocations now. And actually, the communication volume is significantly less. What is significantly less? Well, on the, ran, on the run that we ran on uh, full-scale uh, summit uh, and full-scale uh, pit stein, we had up to, up to 250 times less communication at scale. 
So in fact, we went from petabytes per iteration communication to terabytes per iteration uh, communication volume. So this, of course, gives you a speed up, a significant speed up by, by itself. Then while, doing, while um, carrying out this project, we had some additional interesting performance insights. And basically, one of the insights is that Python is actually slow if you just use Python. Because we started with um, the or original C++ code uh, written by Matthew. But in order to get it into our framework, we asked him to rewrite that code in Python. And this is now sounds uh, quite strange because I'm like, okay, 90,000 lines of code you rewrite, but the core could be, could be rewritten uh, in about 5,000 lines of Python code, which was quite encouraging because as many of you know, Python is a highly productive language. But if you run that code, um, the Python code, as you will see here, the original Omen code took about 1,000 second, uh, seconds for the SSE phase. The Python code itself took, uh, unfortunately, 31,000 seconds. So great, by rewriting it in Python, we made it um, yeah, a lot slower. But the eventual DACE version that we were able to compile, uh, we, we optimized the data flow in that version, obviously, and we also compiled it back to C++ code uh, that executed fast, was running in only 29 seconds. So going from 1,000 in the original code to 29 seconds for this particular um, execution on a pit stained uh, single node. What we also learned is that for some cases, kublas can be quite inefficient. Um, and the interesting insight here is if the matrices are not a square, then the kublas seems to pad. And because it performs quite a lot of uh, flops in the calculation, but it doesn't deliver a lot of performance, so it doesn't deliver a lot of useful flops. So if you look at the um, percent of peak here on the V V100, uh, for example, we get 84% peak in the flop count, but only 5.9% is useful. <laughs> so somehow there seems to be some uh, padding going on, which is quite interesting because if you flop the mice, if you want to achieve the highest possible flop rate, then this is quite nice. But if you want to achieve the highest possible application performance, then this may not be the best idea. So with DACE, we could even optimize that specific function um, by a significant fraction and make it thus uh, also much faster. So we also beat um, the non-square case of uh, Kublas here substantially. So now if we run the code on Pitstein with a varying number of GPUs uh, for 5,000 atoms, we can see that the original version of Omen here um, for uh, 7k points so on the left side is strong scaling, on the right side is weak scaling, um, performs reasonable, of course, because it was a Gordon Bell finalist, and um, this was just a computation, and the communication is also reasonable, but if you look at the, K the day's computation, you see that we beat it by a substantial fraction, and the communication is even faster. So the communication is nearly zero in this plot here, because that is the 250x speed up that we got by rearranging uh, the data flow of the overall application. So we have similar results on the uh, on the Summit supercomputer, um, also run at nearly full scale. So you can, uh, and this is not the full scale run yet, sorry, this is only up to uh, 1400 uh, GPUs where the original Omen computation, original Omen communication, the day's computation is significantly faster, just the computation itself, and then the communication here is, is nearly down to zero. But now, we want to also present a hero run, so one run that actually filled the whole machine and was um, filled the whole machine in Summit, where we really used 27,000 or more than 27,000 V100 GPUs, um, and where we solved a very large uh, problem in, in Matthew's domain, so this quantum transport uh, simulation. And if we look at the uh, scaling efficiency here for our uh, version of the code, because the original version did actually, I mean, the original Omen did not run at that scale at reasonable time, as you can see, saw in the previous plot, we um, achieved um, up to 56 petaflops per second total, which is about a 20, uh, 28, 29 per second uh, percent uh, of the peak, overall peak double precision performance of that system at a scaling efficiency of more than 70%. So it actually scales quite nice. And what the interesting insight here is, is that over the original uh, version of Omen, with everything taken together, we get about a 20, uh, sorry, a 100 times speed up um, because the original Omen does not scale further. We can also uh, process many more atoms, so it's a win-win situation in all regards. And on Pitstein, 
um, our rearrangement of the code even achieved the 417 time uh, 417 times uh, speed up where basically the communication volume went from 17 petabyte per iteration on summit to 87 terabyte per iteration so just to summarize, uh, no there's actually one more thing but i won't have enough uh, time to go through this i could also explain how the framework itself would work at the fine-grained scale so you can also uh, i explained to you how this, the data-centric view works at the coarse grain scale by optimizing the MPI communication. Remember, we got this 250 to 400x reduction in communication, but we do the exact same thing at the register level, so how to vectorize. And you can see here the development of one of the uh, kernels in the SSE function, where we go through map fission, data layout transformation, straighted multiplication, and then even the specialized implementation of the SPSMM function that I alluded to earlier. That is also done within the context of the framework and all data centric at the end. So just to, to wrap up, I mean, as I mentioned, this project is funded by the, by the ERC the, that I received a couple of years ago, which is now running highly successfully. So we showed that data movement is actually a central concept or a central problem in high performance computing that has largely been ignored in the way we program today. Um, we showed one way to attack this, and of course there will be many other ways to attack this, so I actually hope that the community will uh, stand up and now embrace this data-centric view and uh, create some competition for us. In our specific implementation, we separate the concerns between domain scientists and performance engineer, and then the system. The key is that the performance engineer has the data-centric view. Then we implement a full interface that, that shows all of this, I mean a visual interface, because now, of course, if you look at the data-centric representation, it's a textual representation that we are used to today is maybe not the most efficient one. But honestly, we are still exploring these things. We have a textual as well as a, a graphical representation for these graphs, and we will see which ones, uh, which one will um, um, perform best at the end. We showed you lots of performance data for micro benchmarks. We showed you that one application, um, the Omen application of quantum transport uh, simulation. Uh, actually, the framework itself was able to um, improve it by a factor of 100x. And remember, this is a, a two times Gordon Bell finalist. So this was not a, a baseline code that was untuned or something. This code was actually highly optimized. And we enabled a new science with this framework itself. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and uh, get back to Rich. So great, Torsten. I'm glad we could record this. Uh, one question came to mind. You know, we live in a time of uh, multiple memory hierarchies, right? We have yes. we have DRAM, we have persistent memory, we have uh, you know NVMe. We've got uh, this Optane stuff. Could this uh, work within your framework that you just described? Yes, this is, that is actually part of the motivation for that framework because the yeah. memory hierarchies get more and more complex. It's not necessarily even a hierarchy. I wouldn't call it memory network because it's not always hierarchical. And uh, this complexity needs to be managed somehow. And, and the big question is exactly, well, how do you manage this? And this is where the data-centric view comes in. Okay, okay. Well, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.